All right, line A4, learning task two, we're going to describe RC series circuits. Now, we have already covered a lot of base theory, so the first little bit's going to once again be a bunch of review, but it's stuff that we have to have down pat before we jump into anything further. So let's get into it. First thing we're going to do is we're going to once again define what a capacitor is. A capacitor is simply going to go and be two metal plates with room for us to go and store coulombs. That's going to be physical finite number of electrons. And it's going to be separated by some type of an insulating material. The insulating material, once it gets placed underneath electrical stress, is going to be referred to as our dielectric. And we know that this thing is going to go and store its energy in the distorted electrostatic fields right those fields that we have around every charged particle uh, we have this one over here like that if we bring another positive one together towards this one what's going to happen is that this positive one is going to go and have distorted right these electrostatic lines of force cannot go across and so as a result they're going to go and get distorted there's going to be a pushback coming from these because they're getting pushed backwards same with these ones here would get pushed away as well that's where we store our energy inside of them and we've got a short form saying for capacitors which is that a capacitor is a component that is going to go and oppose any change in voltage and the way that it opposes any change in voltage is through the use of current through electrons that it's going to go and store on its plate and deliver away from the plate when the voltage is rising it stores electrons on the plate it you know slows down that rate of rise when the voltage is falling it delivers electrons off of those plates as well okay let's look at a simple diagram of what happens inside of these ones if we were to go and have a circuit that had capacitance alone so where i have a supply and I just have that cap, we'll draw a DC one here first. That DC one, what we would see is we would go and have the instant that we apply voltage to this thing, we're going to go and slowly build the voltage that would go and be across that cap. As soon as we change that thing to an AC circuit, we'll use the same symbol over here, even though it is a polarized symbol, just to differentiate it from any sort of a contact. But as soon as I put it onto AC, I am going to have the total voltage that has to be dropped across here and the way that we're going to go and drop the total voltage across here is we're going to go and provide a voltage force that is going to be counteracting whatever i'm going to be supplying for my ac that voltage force is all going to be based upon the number of electrons that we are going to store on any plates and we see this inside of this graph over here where we are going to go and have the q value which in this case q stands for the coulombs the total finite number of electrons that we are going to store on those plates we know that as we store more electrons onto the plate, so over here we see once we're at peak voltage, we would obviously be at the peak amount of coulombs that we would go and char a store onto there as well, which would mean that the run of current to this would have to be at an absolute minimum. Right over there, when we hit peak coulombs stored on the plates, our line current, that's what this I is, is going to be at an absolute minimum. And then as my voltage drops away, we're going to start to release electrons back off of these plates, which means that my current is going to start to pick up. And by the time I get my voltage down to this point over here, there is no longer going to be any opposition to the electrons that are going to be flying off of the plates at that point, which means that we are going to be at maximum current flow over there. Once again, talking about line current. We do use the formulas that my I is equal to my E over top of R, my straight up Ohm's law that I have, but we're going to go and change this to now to go and stand for capacitance, right? We're going to talk about the current to a capacitor, the IC, is going to be equal to the EC, the voltage over the capacitor, divided by the, not the resistance, but what we refer to as our reactance, our XC that we're going to have on that capacitor. When we have got high amounts of capacitance, we're going to go and have more electrons that we're going to have to move for a given voltage. So I'm going to have a higher amount of current, which would be the same alert to me having a low reactance. And when my frequency is high, I once again have to go and move lots of electrons relatively quickly, which would mean I'd have lots of current, which would be the same as if my current or the same as if my reactants were to go and be low. So we have a bunch of formulas that then start to show up. We've gone over most of these formulas, but we'll quickly review them. The first formula that we have is going to be my XC. XC is equal to 1 over top of 2 pi FC. I do want to note that inside of your book, they use this symbol over here. Whatever their graphics translator was that they had inside of uh, this module when it last went to print, clearly the uh, character recognition did not recognize the pi symbol, and so it's inserted in a load of 
these ones, especially in the next couple of learning tasks, uh, we're going to see a lot of times where the pi has been substituted by that not equal sign. If you see that not equal sign, you should be able to recognize this sort of a layout. If it's this sort of a layout, that's what it means. If you're unsure, just make sure you ask me during the live session uh, about whether or not that was meant to be inside of there. But I see absolutely no reason why we would ever use a not equals inside of this module. We've got that formula that shows up though, our XC, our capacitive reactants, which talks about that, you know, my inverse relationship. Basically, as my frequency would go up or as my capacitance would go up, my opposition to my capacitance, uh, to my current that would be going there would be dropping as well. We also had a couple of other formulas. C is equal to Q over top of V, the number of electrons that I store per the volts that I'm going to have is gonna give me my capacitance. And from that, you could also go and derive Q is equal to my C and my V. The, the coulombs, the physical number of electrons is gonna be based upon the capacitance size multiplied by the volts. And if I want to isolate for the volts, the volts would be equal to my Q over top of my C that I would have. The number of uh, electrons that I physically stored over top of the size is going to go and tell me what the amount of volts would be off of here. They do give you another formula inside of the book uh, that has a 10 to the power of six over top of there. And so they say that since capacitance is usually given in microfarads, this formula is written as 10 to the six over top. To be honest, this is the only place inside of the only, inside of all the binders across all three years that you're going to go and see it. So just disregard that one where they've got the 10 to the power of six. That uh, 10 to the power of six nonsense is just somebody showing off their mathematics. We're not gonna use it because for some of you, it's really gonna go on to lead to confusion later on. We could use it, but there's not a lot of points in it because it doesn't describe, which is what we're trying to do, uh, capacitance any better. Just ignore that whole formula. Let's talk about this relationship that we have inside of here. So we define that, you know, as our volts rises, we get more Q. Therefore, as we reach our peak Q or stored number of electrons, our amount of line current is going to be at a minimum. And then as my voltage drops away, my line current is going to be at a maximum as I'm able to deliver off of there with no opposition. Once again, as we covered inside of our A1 module, this is a stabilized system. It's had a couple of cycles to go and stabilize its initial amount of coulombs, volts, and current, etc. And once we get to the stabilized system, we're able to go and recognize the layout between our current and our voltage. You should recognize that our current is going down over here as well as our voltage. And you should be able to go and split that apart and say that, look, if this is a 360 degree waveform from here to here, Half of that's 180, half of that's going to be 90 degrees. And so I see that there's a 90 degree difference between these two. Which one is going to go and be leading? Well, I see that my current has crossed before my voltage. And we use that mnemonic, ICE, for these ones. My current leads the voltage when it is in a capacitive type of circuit. What we'll do is we will go and graph it like this if I wanted to go and deal with my voltage as being a reference. Or if I wanted to go and have my current as a reference, which is going to be more handy to us, we would go and graph it like this. Closed current, I C, and then I would be able to go and say my current leads my voltage VC by 90 degrees, right? It's the exact same graph. It's just been rotated, you know, 90 degrees down like this. But we're going to utilize that because once we're dealing with series circuits, we're going to go and keep current always as being our uh, component that's going to be in common. They do a quick little review as well about what DC working voltage is, just the fact that every capacitor is going to be rated for a maximum amount of voltage and that you have to be aware anytime that you're using AC that it's going to go to a peak value and you got to make sure, of course, that it's going to be rated for AC. All base theory covered in previous learning tasks. Let's talk about the power and about the series circuits because that's what we're here for. The power for a purely capacitive type of circuit is going to be partially in the positive range and partially in the negative range, then back into the positive, then back into the negative. And it's always going to be opposite to that of my inductive systems. Inductive systems start for the same voltage waveform. I would have an inductive system that would start power down there and then go power up here, etc. We'll take a look at how they cancel each other later on. But for now, you should recognize that they're a very similar wave uh, shape and that they're going to be operating at the same frequency, right? We see that our power frequency is going to be double that of our source. 
voltage that we have. If this was a 60 hertz waveform, this would have to be a 120 hertz power waveform. Okay, let's place this now into a proper series circuit because that's what this learning task is supposed to be about. If we take a look at this, we see that we have got XCs that are given to us, we have got resistances that are given to us, and we see that we have got a voltage that is given to us as well. There is no current that is laid out inside of here on the graph. However, inside of your very first um, paragraph kind of underneath this or maybe second or third or what something like that they do give you that this thing is a 5 amp that we are going to have so let's add that 5 amp into there and then let's go through our solving once again we can use pythagoras we can use sine cosine angles etc or we can go and utilize our sharp calculator and we are going to use that sharp calculator to go and figure some stuff out inside of here first of all looking at these I see that I can establish an impedance triangle. Now, I don't always use impedance triangles, but inside of a series circuit, it is 100% allowable. So in this case, I am going to go and use that impedance triangle. And the reason that I'm going to do it is because I'm looking for my angle. Because once I've got that angle, I can then go and take everything into volts and amps and everything else like that. Power is all going to be able to be derived off of that. So I'm just going to use these two to go and create that. If I wanted to, knowing that it's an impedance, what I could do is I could go and use XC and R, and I could go and use the tangent of that, or the inverse tangent of these two together, which would spit out the angle, or I can punch them into the calculator. We're gonna do the calculator method. I've got 20 along my X axis over here. I've got this that is going to be along my Y axis. It's gonna be at a negative 90 degrees because we're gonna use our current as our reference inside of here, and the voltage for that would be at negative 90 degrees. So let's go and put that in, 20 angle zero, that's my resistance, plus 15 angle negative 90, equals a value of, oh, 20 angle zero plus 15 angle 90, Ah, that's what's going on. Sorry, I'm in the wrong mode. I was wondering why it's spinning out. See a little XY up there? It just confused me for a second. Let's go and convert this into R theta. It was just basically telling me my XY coordinates, which would make sense as being 20 and 15. Then what I punched in here was correct. 20 angle 0, 15 angle negative 90. I'm now in my polar or my R theta over here. And so it's spinning out a total impedance of 25 at an angle of 36.87 degrees. I'm going to take that over here. My Z is equal to 25 and my angle is 36.87 degrees that I'm going to go and have over here. If I take the cosine of my angle, I'm able to go and figure out my power factor. We'll come back to that one in a minute, as well as we're gonna come back to all the rest of the, the power and voltages, etc. But for now, let's start by developing everything off of my supply side. I prefer Personally, I prefer to develop everything starting from my source because my source, if it all matches going back down into the system, I know that it's good to go off of there. Let's start with what we can solve with here at the source. We know our angular degrees, which means that I can go and make a couple of different triangles based off of that angular degrees. I could go make a voltage triangle, which would be this one here, 125 at an angle of 36 degrees, uh, 36.87, we've got that angle. I can also go and make it my impedance one. We just did that impedance one. That one was 25 at my angle. That one would be volts, that one would be ohms. This is my impedance triangle. And then the last one that I would be able to make would be my power triangle that I'm going to have. And we don't have the value for power yet, but we do know what lays along which axis. Is. And I do prefer to work with the power because power is not going to go and lie to us. I see that I have got my line voltage over here as well as I've got my line current. So I'm going to go and take those two and E line times I line equals BA over here. So we'll multiply those together. <clears throat> One, two, five times five, which gets me out to a value of 625 BA. 
this is going to be important to us because now that we've got the 625 VA, we can develop all of our watts and we can develop all of our bars directly off of it. We know how many degrees this thing is going to be in it. So I'll just go back to my calculator, 625 angle 36.87, which I hit enter and that just stores in there. We're still in R theta. We're gonna convert this down to my XY's. I see that for my X value, it's gonna be 499.99993, which there's a little bit of rounding on our degrees. Otherwise it should be a true 500. We'll get to that one in a second. And then I see that my Y value, oh, uh, I just cleared that by accident. Let me just put that in one more time there. Uh, 625 angle 36.87. It's got me to an X value of 499 and then second comma, a Y value of 375 that I would have off of there. Let's put those in because those are important ones to us because once we have these, we can always, always, always go and add them into any series parallel compound type of circuit. This over here on this vertical axis, my Y is always going to be my bars or my quadrature or useless type of power. This over here on the bottom, my X axis is always going to go and be, that's a poor W, I'll make that better, my watts that I'm going to have. 625 VA, 500 watts, 375 bars that I have. The rest of these triangles, we can just fill out based upon what we have. These ones were given these values. R is going to go and be 20 and XC is going to go and be 15. I could double check it, but we derived this one off of that one, so there's not much point. We're working backwards through it. And then my last one over here is gonna be my voltage triangle, which is going to be, once again, based upon what I have dropped over top of these. Now I can do V is equal to I times R, and your book does go through some of that to develop the values of voltages. Or I can go and develop my voltages off of this 125 degrees and this angle, which is what I'm gonna to prefer to do over here. I'm gonna clear this, I'm gonna go back into my polar. You can input them inside of your X, Y as well, but we'll do it in polar just for the practice. It's gonna be 125 at an angle of 36.87, which equals 125. So now I've got it stored in there after I hit that, I go convert to X, Y. Tells me that my X value First value it always shows is X is going to be 99.99986, so 100. There's that little bit of rounding in our angle that we had there before. And if I go second comma, it tells me that I'm going to have 75 as my Y value. So I place those into here. This is going to be 75 volts. This is going to be uh, my 100 volts over top of my resistor. You can go back through the way that the book calculates. They're calculating everything properly. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the way that they're going through their calculations. Uh, however, they're just sometimes a little bit more convoluted than they need to be. But it's good to go through and take a look at the way that they develop their watts, their bars. They're showing you multiple different methods that you can go and use all of your Ohm's law and your Watts law methods to develop any one of these values. So go through, make sure you're um, I guess, you know, competent inside of each of these ways of doing the calculations. You're not always going to have the calculator available, or maybe, you know, you might uh, not be able to remember how, or you have a, a faulty calculator or something like that. It's not bad to be able to do it through your Ohm's law, but it's going to be so, so much easier later on when we get into all the power factor correction, etc. if you are able to go and use that polar and that XY mode inside of your calculator. Last thing that we talk about inside of this one, so they have all the uh, triangles. By the way, I drew my triangles upside down over here. Uh, I shouldn't have done it like that. We know where the voltage is. We had just defined that up top over here that we should be doing that. That was just sloppy on my part, but I'm so used to, you know, just drawing triangles as I go along. And it's difficult to sometimes remember which way to put everything when I'm trying to talk and write all at the same time. So my apologies, these ones should each be flipped. over and they should be looking like the rest of these ones over here. You'll take a look at their voltage triangle. Their voltage triangle ends up at the exact same values as ours. If you take a look at their impedance triangle, they got that one labeled as being impedance, but it wasn't impedance. That one was voltage over there once again. Um, 
A penis triangle should have had all of our impedance values off of it. And then they did have their VA and their bars and their watts, which would be our power triangle. That's going to be the really useful one to us. And then they showed at the very end that if I've got all three of these together, that I should see that they're all similar in the way that they are laid out, their angular degrees that they have off of these. Okay, uh, that covers this one off. Um, anything else? Oh, power factor. We should just talk really briefly about power factor. You know what power factor is. It's going to be my watts over top of my VA. Once again, we're going to go and have a power factor for these, but we would call the power factor for any of these triangles a leading type of power factor. If we go into this watts over here, it would be 500 over top of 625, which if we do that one, 500 divided by 625, it brings me out to that 80% power factor that we have again. But we would say that this would be an 80% leading power factor leading power factor off of here. Because it's capacitive, anything that's capacitive is going to be termed as being leading. Anything that's going to be inductive is going to be termed as being lagging for us. All right, that covers us off through series RC. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go and combine our R, our L, and our C together.